For decades, rockets have been launched in much the same way, by burning fuel, either liquid or solid, to push an enormous mass into orbit. That's why engineers and scientists are constantly looking for ways to squeeze even more performance out of rocket systems, optimizing them to the limit using both existing and emerging technologies. SpaceX is a leader in this pursuit, developing incredibly high-performance rockets powered by cutting-edge engines. However, we are already nearing the physical limits of what chemical propulsion can achieve. So what if we could give rockets a head start by launching them at high velocity from an aircraft? In theory, this approach could save a significant amount of fuel and increase payload capacity. Sounds promising, right? But if it's such a good idea, why isn't it used more often? How practical is air launching rockets really? Let's explore that right now. Air launch to orbit is a method of sending smaller rockets into low Earth orbit by launching them at high altitude from a larger conventional aircraft. While it might seem like a modern innovation, the concept is far from new. In fact, it evolved from air launch techniques used for experimental aircraft as far back as the late 1940s, so this approach has been around for quite some time. An obvious benefit of air launch to orbit is the reduced delta V needed to achieve orbit. Any rocket, including the Falcon 9, faces the harsh reality of the Tchaikovsky rocket equation at liftoff. If you want to send more mass farther, you need more fuel to do it. But fuel has mass, so now you have even more mass to push. To push that mass, you add more fuel, but that fuel also has mass, so you need even more fuel to carry the fuel you have already added. This is the tyranny of the rocket equation. The more fuel you have, the more fuel you need to carry it. Most of a rocket's propellant is burned just fighting gravity and atmospheric drag in the first few minutes of launch. Once it reaches a certain altitude and speed, continuing to orbit becomes much more efficient. By getting a boost from an aircraft, rockets can start from a much higher point in the atmosphere. This results in a better payload to fuel ratio and reduces the cost per kilogram to orbit. To take even greater advantage of the Delta V savings, supersonic air launch to orbit systems have been proposed. Another benefit of launching from a higher altitude is starting in a thinner atmosphere. Rocket nozzles are most efficient when the exhaust gases have expanded just enough to match the ambient pressure at the nozzle exit. At sea level, the surrounding air pressure is relatively high, so the nozzle does not need to allow much expansion. However, this limits performance, as too much expansion at sea level can lead to problems. In contrast, in the near vacuum of space, the exhaust gases can expand far more, allowing for greater energy extraction from the same amount of propellant. In an ideal vacuum, the most efficient nozzle would theoretically be infinitely large, enabling maximum expansion. Of course, such a design is not physically feasible, so engineers have to strike a balance between efficiency and practicality when designing nozzle sizes. This design compromise is clearly illustrated in SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. The first stage, which operates near sea level, fits nine engines optimized for high atmospheric pressure within a 3.7 meter diameter. The upper stage, which operates in near vacuum conditions, carries only a single, much larger vacuum-optimized engine within the same diameter. This vacuum engine has a significantly larger nozzle to accommodate the greater expansion needed for optimal performance in low-pressure environments. A general rule in rocket design is that the pressure at the nozzle exit should not fall below roughly 40% of the ambient atmospheric pressure. At sea level 1 bar, this means the exhaust exit pressure should remain above about 0.4 bar to avoid flow separation. Flow separation can create dangerous instabilities, potentially damaging the nozzle or causing catastrophic failure. That is why sea level engines cannot have extremely high expansion ratios. However, if we launch from higher altitudes, for example, around 10 kilometers, approximately 33,000 feet, the atmosphere is only about one quarter as dense as its sea level. At this altitude, a rocket engine can safely use a nozzle with a much higher expansion ratio, perhaps 25 to 1. 
This would translate to a noticeable improvement in efficiency and could add several seconds to the engine's specific impulse. It is not just the rocket that got the advantages. The aircraft used in an air launch system brings its own set of benefits too. Using jet engines in a launch system makes a lot of sense on paper. An air-breathing carrier aircraft can lift the rocket to altitude far more efficiently. Jet engines, such as turbofans, do not require onboard oxidizers and instead use the surrounding air to generate thrust. This means the launch system conserves a significant amount of mass that would otherwise be allocated to oxidizer, reducing the overall size and fuel requirements. As a result, a larger portion of the rocket's mass can be dedicated to payload, lowering the cost per kilogram to orbit. There is also the potential for aircraft-like operations, including launch-on-demand capability. Since the aircraft can avoid poor weather by simply flying around it, launches become less constrained by atmospheric conditions. Air launch to orbit also provides a valuable alternative when ground-based vertical launches are not possible. Natural disasters such as earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, or volcanic eruptions can disrupt or damage fixed ground infrastructure. With air launch, there is no need for a launch pad or blockhouse, and the launch occurs far from populated areas, which helps reduce insurance costs. Perhaps the biggest advantage of air launching is its flexibility in reaching a wide range of orbital inclinations. The carrier aircraft can position the rocket for launch from almost anywhere on Earth, making it possible to reach unique or otherwise hard-to-access orbits. In contrast, traditional ground-based launch providers often need multiple launch sites in different locations to reach the full spectrum of orbital targets, which adds significant cost and complexity. So, with all those advantages, why don't we see rockets launched from airplanes or jets more often? The biggest limitation is that aircraft are usually not big enough. For example, the Falcon 9 booster is 45 meters long and 3.7 meters in diameter, which is a fairly standard size for a medium lift rocket. Now compare that to a decent sized commercial aircraft. A Boeing 737, which typically carries around 170 passengers, has a fuselage that is almost the same width. It is about 4 meters tall and 39.5 meters long. When you look at the mass, the comparison becomes even more dramatic. A fully loaded 737 at its maximum takeoff weight comes in at about 78,000 kilograms. In contrast, a fully fueled Falcon 9 weighs around 550,000 kilograms. So, to carry a full-sized orbital rocket, you would need an extremely large aircraft. That is why most air-launched systems are limited to smaller rockets carrying lighter payloads. That said, there have been successful launches into space using both jets and rockets in a way. In the 1960s, the X-15 rocket plane was carried to high altitude under the wing of a jet-powered B-52 bomber before being released and igniting its own rocket engine. Technically, test pilot Joe Walker became the first American to fly into space twice by riding the X-15. More recently, programs like Virgin Orbit have used a converted 747 airliner to launch small rockets, which are dropped mid-flight before igniting and carrying satellites into orbit. In the case of Virgin Orbit, the company launched a rocket called Launcher 1, a two-stage air-launched vehicle. The rocket had a diameter of 1.6 meters for the first stage and 1.3 meters for the second stage and payload fairing. On October 24, 2019, the company announced plans to develop a three-stage variant capable of launching 100 kilograms to the moon, 70 kilograms to Venus, or 50 kilograms to Mars. Launcher 1 was designed to deliver up to 300 kilograms to a 500-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit, which made it well-suited for CubeSats and other small payloads. A pretty decent small-lift rocket, I must say. The Boeing 747 it flew on was also not a regular passenger jet. It had been heavily modified. The Launcher 1 attachment pylon was installed on the left wing, in the same position where a standard 747 has a fifth engine mount used for ferrying spare engines. This spot is located between the fuselage and the left inboard engine. Launcher 1 would be dropped from this aircraft, 
named Nicosmic Girl at an altitude of about 11,000 meters. The maximum payload limit for Launcher 1 operations using Cosmic Girl was 400 kilograms. You could say Virgin Orbit did just about everything right to maximize the program's success. So, it would be natural to assume it would all turn out well, right? Well, Launcher 1 made six flights between 2020 and 2023, with four successes and two failures. After the second failure in January 2023, and the company's inability to secure further funding, Virgin Orbit laid off most of its staff and suspended operations in March 2023. The company was sold through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy auction on May 22, 2023. Turns out it wasn't good enough. So, what went wrong? Besides the fact that a rocket's weight and size are limited by the aircraft that carries it, the advantage of air launch is not always as strong as it appears in theory. By the time a rocket reaches an altitude of around 10 or 11 kilometers during a traditional vertical launch, it already has significantly more momentum than a 747 can provide to a rocket at that same altitude. In fact, most rockets are typically traveling two to three times faster than Launcher 1 was when it was released from the 747. Not only that, but a vertically launched rocket is already following its ideal trajectory by that point. At around 10 kilometers, a typical rocket is angled between 60 and 75 degrees from horizontal, climbing steeply to exit the dense part of the atmosphere as efficiently as possible, even as it begins pitching over to follow its gravity turn. By contrast, an airliner like the 747 flies mostly horizontal flight paths. Because of this, before releasing Launcher 1, Cosmic Girl had to pitch up sharply to better align the rocket's velocity with its ideal ascent path. Even with that effort, once Launcher 1 was released, it still had to perform a significant pitch-up maneuver to get itself onto the correct trajectory for orbital insertion. Now you can see why. Even though the idea of launching rockets from an airplane or jet has been around for a long time, it has never really become a standout, practical method. Most air launch systems are either retired, undeveloped, or only occasionally active. A few are still operational, but they are not widely used. So, does a company like SpaceX ever consider this approach? After all, they are known for doing bold and groundbreaking things. If they can build a massive rocket like Starship, maybe they could find a way to make air launch truly work and unlock all its theoretical advantages. Well, I don't think that is likely, at least not any time soon. SpaceX already has more than enough near-impossible engineering challenges on its plate, and taking on another one would probably be stretching too far. Besides, Elon Musk is known for wanting to simplify systems as much as possible, and air launch doesn't really fit that philosophy. It adds complexity rather than removing it. That said, air launch remains a very cool concept. It just needs a few more technological breakthroughs before it can become truly practical and cost-effective on a larger scale.